Dick manages a diversified crop, cattle, and timber operation in northern Idaho in partnership with three family members. He also provides seminars and private consulting services to farmers, ranchers, agribusiness, and lenders. He is a founder and past president of the PNDSA. He's a board member and past president of the Farm Financial Standards Council and also serves on the faculty of the Executive Program for Agricultural Producers, or TPAP. So join me in welcoming Dick to the stage. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. This is kind of like a homecoming for me. Um, one of the most exciting things I've ever gotten to do in my life was to become part of the group that helped get this organization going many years ago and uh, little did I know where the the journey would take all of us in this room. I don't know that I've added near as much as I've taken away from the relationship we've had over the years. I feel very humbled to be in a room where most of you in this room know way more about farming than I ever will and uh, really what this is all about is learning from each other. Today I'm going to take a little bit of time just to give you a quick overview of our our journey our operation and how we started back in the 70s and how we got to today in terms of adoption of the principles of direct seeding. And I want to focus on how the PNDSA has really helped us on that journey. I think they've been a critical part of us getting to where we are. And then I want to end this with what are the challenges that I would like to throw at you for the future. We are a fairly diversified operation with grain, cattle, timber, and wildlife. We're farming in two counties with an elevation range from 1,200 to 4,300 feet. We have more diversity in our farm and some of the states in the Union have an entire state. So when you take 66 fields and the diversity of climates we have, there is no one size fits all. Um, when we first started farming in, in uh, Lewis County, people said, you're going to get a lesson now. You can't use those things you did down there up here. We said, oh yeah? Well, we succeeded and there are a lot of people now that we were learning from people that were doing it there and others are learning that you can do this just about anywhere. We're a business that's in transition. We've been in transition for a long time, both as a farm and a family business and as a business transitioning practices. So we've been in experimentation, probably made every mistake you can made over the last 30 years on how to farm. We have a very diversified crop rotation system. Um, we can grow as many as 12 different crops. And we're fortunate that we have the soil variety and we have the rainfall varieties that allow us to do that. The typical rotation, we're shooting for a winter wheat, spring wheat, pulse, winter wheat oil seed, where the spring wheat could also be a spring barley. That's our ideal, but then we cheat all the time. So if you look at our real rotation, it's some variation of this five year. But you'll notice the key things in here are there's grains, there's oil seeds, and there's pulses. And we will learn a lot of lessons about the value of having that diversity in a rotation. Our journey has been a lot of baby steps. Uh, we started experimenting clear back in the 70s with different kinds of, at that time we were calling it no-till. Um, we've tried about every kind of drill there is from hay buster, blue zero till, ag pro, John Deere, case IH. We've tried every kind of trash cleaner in the world, but when you're trying to grow stuff in a, anywhere from a nine to a 12 inch spacing, trying to do trash cleaners has not worked very well. One of the things that's really helped us is that we learned early the value of making strategic alliances with neighbors, where we not only traded tractors and drills, but we traded knowledge. A lot of times what you were buying when you had someone and do custom work was you were buying their experience so that you could learn how they did it and add your knowledge to that so you got two for the price of one. Another major journey that we can't say we were very smart going forward, it was just by accident. Um, looking back, it turned out to be a very critical step is that we started lengthening and diversifying our rotations early in the game long before we went to direct seeding. And as you look at people talking about failures in direct seed systems, we're learning in hindsight that that was critical to the success today. We gradually transitioned from plowing to chiseling to disking. At the same time, we were transitioning from a wheat pea two-year rotation to a longer period of wheat, barley, peas. And then when we introduced canola, we were one of the few in the area that started growing canola. And to show you how hard it was to do this, 
if you grew it, there was nowhere to store it because none of the warehouses would take spring canola because they didn't want to mix it with winter rape. So fortunately, someone like Intermountain Canola came around and said, if you grow this crazy crop, we'll build you some bins. And if you can survive after three years, you can have the bins. That was a critical step in getting us into the oil seeds industry. Um, by 1999, we had pretty much transitioned 100 percent to direct seeding. Well, we were in a one-pass system, putting four products down with the drill, and the only other thing we did in that field every year is a heavy harrow, sometimes a Schulte Moore, and uh, a sprayer. Along with the journey to direct seeding, we've also had an amazing path on transition in technology and, and use of precision ag. I remember in the early 80s when I first came back to the farm, we had a combine, a John Deere combine sprayer that went about four miles an hour on average. But that was about two miles an hour going up a hill and about 10 miles an hour going down a hill. And so you can imagine the uniformity of the application rate was not very good. And when we put our first Dickie John's computer on that thing, it was like, wow, do you know how fast you're going downhill and you know how fast you're going uphill with a belt drive that slips all the time? And it opened our eyes to how much lack of precision we were having. And that was before guidance, so that wasn't even counting the overlap. It was just that we were over, over applying where we needed it the least, and we were under applying where we needed it the most. So we've come a long ways from that, where we have virtually every kind of technology you can imagine on sprayers, combines, drills. It's precision ag, it's auto boom shutoffs, it's guidance, auto boom, auto steer, it's standard on everything. We first started into this, nobody wanted to get into a tractor that had a computer in it. Now no one will get into a tractor if it doesn't work. Because we were so afraid of the amount of overlap and the inaccuracy that we would have if we don't have these tools, that we wouldn't even think about running it without it today. Our evolution in drills has gone back and forth from hoe to disc drills. And today we've got, the, I think, the best of both worlds with both a flexicoil hoe drill it's putting four starters down. It's using the Xactric system for applying fertilizer. All the precision ag tools, auto steer, variable rate you can have. And two years ago, we, we bought a John Deere drill, fixed it up similar with a four product application. We feel like these two drills now give us the diversity to do to about any condition, any kind of crop you want to seed. Years ago, we believe very much in uh, being politically correct, so we never had the same color in any part of the system. So we, we were equally loved by all the equipment vendors. We had CAT, and we had John Deere, and we had Case. And over time, we've evolved the systems where we don't have quite so many colors, but we learned a lot from each of these pieces. Uh, today, our hoe drill is, is a 45-foot drill. That, it's amazing. It's a 12-inch spacing drill that puts down four products and produces an absolutely beautiful uniform crop if you put it in the right conditions. It's got the solution tank, the anhydrous tank, the three-part system in the cart has solution in the center tank. So we've basically flexible said we won't warranty this if you do this, but we did it anyway. You know, farmers, heck with warranty. We'll, uh, and we learned this from looking at what other farmers had tried. We had a 33-foot flex coil drill that was our mainstay for many years. It was replaced by this 45-foot drill you see here. Both those drills did a great job for us. Um, when you start introducing wider drills, more weight, the addition of the quad tracks allows us to pretty much go where we want to go, not where you could go. And with auto steering, it's just amazing to go out and just say, I want to seed this field this way. And you can start in the end or the middle or the outside and have everything come out exactly where you want. This new John Deere drill is it's great. It has some challenges. You, you learn you not, not turn downhill. You better have this thing in the ground because it will beat you to the bottom of the hill. So these are things that you Australians can't appreciate. Um, when you pick it up out of the ground, you turn the corner, it just follows you around the corner. But in our part of the world, you really think about gravity and what it's going to do to your systems. So it takes a lot, of grow, a lot of operator education before you put somebody in a cab. Um, you can really make a mess. We've had these drills almost pull a tractor out of the field and over the edge of some of our canyons, which is not pretty. So you don't do that very many times before you think very carefully. When you, before you get to the end of the row, what are you going to do before you turn? 
So that's our journey. Many of you have been on our farm. You've been involved with some of the ag tours. So I think what's really more important is to talk about today what is the value of what PNDSCA has provided to us in this room and others that need to make this conversion. Um, let's take a little trip down memory lane. Many of us in this room served on a steep advisory committee years ago where after the annual conference we would meet and talk about what do you need to do next year. And it was a pivotal meeting in 1997 where we sat in a room with a lot of academics and researchers where the, the usual forte was everybody thank you, great job, you know. And that was a meeting where basically it was like 12 people engaged in a spanking contest that said, folks, we got to quit talking about summer follow and burning stubble. We've got to talk about what's important for the future. It's not should we direct seed or no-till, it's how do we get there, what are the things we need to know, what are the strategies that we need to have in place to get there. And to the credit of the steep people, they took that charge and the next year they had a knockout program where if you remember it, how many of you were in the, the Pasco meeting, we had 800 people show up. That to me was an epiphany meeting because we were about 200 to 250 people showing up to these meetings. And just because of the speakers and the agenda, we had 800 people show up that told us, okay, we hit a hot button here. This is what growers want to know. And so that started a journey where we had a, three years of conferences that were showing that this was a long-term interest. Um, in Pendleton, after the, th the third one of these, it's amazing what rolling out a bunch of beer does to inspiring great ideas. Uh, Tim Melville maybe disagree with me on that, but there was a lot of beer drinking, a lot of big talk about we need a formal organization and from that the decision was we need to build a formal organization that's committed to helping growers make this implementation on a more permanent basis. And it was a classic thing, if you build it they will come. We were fortunate to get Dwayne Beck and Jim Cook to do some inspiring front end um, symposiums that talked about what you could do, shared what some other organizations in the US and Canada were doing. We had a group of people that they kind of came together as a group and I don't know how I ended up in this group because most of these people were way smarter than I ever was about farming. But uh, I'll never forget when we were in a direct seed conference in Spokane, we were having breakfast as a board and somebody says, hey look, there's the 12 apostles of direct seeding. I never thought I would be called the 12 apostles of anything. But it was really humbling to be in a room with people from Oregon, Washington, and Idaho who really had a vision for what we could do and where we could go and uh, I feel very humbled to have to have been part of that group. After that initial meeting we sat down as a group and created a mission, vision and a plan of operation and that's, this is what we ended up with. It was an organization that basically was here to promote economically viable and environmentally sustainable cropping systems. And I want to emphasize these two terms because so much of this talk is about farming and agronomics but very seldom do we balance that discussion with the economics. Now I remember Joe Anderson many years ago from Potlatch, he said, you know, there's a lot of people push back on some of these conservation programs. He says, I don't know of a farmer around that if you didn't show him how if a change in a practice would add one more damn dollar to his bottom line, he wouldn't do it. Excuse my language there, but I think that's true. We've got to be able to demonstrate that this will add more to our bottom line, in addition to making it more environmentally sustainable. And that, that's been a key challenge of the organization in this process. Over the years, the, the organizations had to really define what's your product. As a service organization, if you don't clearly focus on what you're going to do and how that will affect change, and those products kind of fell into four areas, information transfer, policy development, research coordination, and funding support and membership. I think the original two or three years, four years of operation, we did that really well. Created a website, we had a newsletter that was keeping topics out in front of memberships. We were featuring partners who were helping us with their funding commitments to do what we did. Um, we realized that our audiences were not just ourselves. Farmers are notorious for preaching to the choir. Um, we had a Tanya Wytovich was one of our early administrators and she came up with the idea we need a quality of life brochure. And when we really looked at what we were doing, the bottom line, a lot of what we we're doing is improving quality of life, not just for our farms, not just for our soils, but for the environment, for the, the water, the air, virtually everything we do affects consumers in general. 
So these quality of life brochures became very popular when people were out talking to local chambers of commerce or rotary clubs or environmental organizations that were wondering, well, does every farmer rape and plunder? Are there some, some out there that actually don't do this? We had a good story, and I think that quality of life for sure helped us define what our story was. We also had a lot of videos and other things that we used to promote our, our program. What we're doing this next three days is information exchange, and we, you, we do that in many ways. The, the Direct Seed Conference is a way to harvest a year's worth of this stuff, but throughout the year, if we don't have constant opportunities, it's hard to stay with it. I think one of the most influential things that ever happened was the creation of the Clearwater Direct Seed Breakfast Group. We had people like Dave Barton, Dennis Rowe, Hans Cook that worked with growers and started out with a handful of people and today we're getting over 50 people going to these meetings every three weeks. I just went to the meeting in Lewiston this last week and they had to take the partition out to the next room because they had over 50 people showed up. The only scary part of that meeting was over half the people in the room I didn't know. They were sons and daughters of people that whose parents I had started this thing with 20 some years ago so it's I guess it's exciting to see that our job is not done that we're working on the next generation now and uh, we can kind of step back and be excited that those frankly are going to be the people that survive. Field tours, demonstration projects, we could not get to where we are without both our our research folks as well as growers opening up their farms and that's where the, the rubber meets the ground we really learn what are the things that work one of the things that I think has really been helpful to us in the past is that we haven't just got farmers to these tours. We've made sure that environmental organizations, uh, state and national uh, policymakers are out there hearing our story. Because frankly, there's a lot of folks, and I don't mean this too negatively, but when a lot of our policymakers' homes are within 100 miles of Washington, D.C., they have no idea what's going on out here. And they're making rules and regulations that have no basis in reality because they don't understand our climates, our rainfall, our rotations. So having these people here, having the media involved in these things is critical. One of the things that I think is unique about PNDSA is that we took an active role in policy development. And I never realized this until several years later, um, the CTIC, uh, Conservation Tillage Information Center took a, a leadership effort to try to get all of our no-till groups in the U.S. to work together. And they formed a group called CASA, Conservation Ag Strategic Alliance, I believe is the term. And I was a meeting in California, we had no-till in the plains, we had the Chesapeake no-tillers, we had Mandak people, we had almost the major groups in the U.S. in a room. And they said, you know, we want to be like you guys. And I said, what do you mean? We're really glad you guys are fighting for the policy issues. I'm going, aren't you? No, we just work on the agronomic issues. I don't think that we were the only ones, but I think we made a very conscious effort to be engaged at the state, the county, the national level on critical issues that affect conservation and, and indirectly direct seeding. And we've had a major role in some of the rules that came down in the state technical committees, uh, the design of the CSP. We were one of the first in DC to come there with a plan. And many came there like, okay, how do we decide whether we want to jump in with you guys or not? But the world is run by those who show up. And we were there. And because we were there, and so few others were, frankly, we had way more influence than we deserved to have. So I think this is something we need to really look at is the strength of the organization and down the road with conservation being so important will be a continuing challenge. Crop insurance is a critical part of our farming process. Early in the game, if you direct seeded, you were discriminated against from a crop insurance standpoint. There were people that just simply did not believe that this was a lower risk management system. If you diversified your rotation, you paid a penalty in APHs. So many members in this organization fought very tough battles with RMA to help them get their systems modernized to where they recognize this is a lower risk, this is a more sustainable cropping system, and we can't have a penalty on crop insurance to be doing the right thing. We still have a long ways to go, and we'll get to some of this in the challenges, but I think being engaged in that fight is a critical issue for this organization. 
The climate change is a hot button. There are a lot of people who think it's a hoax. Um, I never realized the journey that this topic would take me on because there was three of us that got involved with trying to figure out way back then what is carbon sequestration. If you remember, shortly after we formed an organization called Environmental Defense Fund, showed it up on our doorstep and said, you guys should be carbon sequestration aggregators. And we said, could you spell that? We had no idea what they were even talking about. But long story short, that became a long journey where we realized that we were the good guys. We we're storing carbon. We're not releasing it in the atmosphere. We're improving soil health. And there's a value to that to the consumer. If we're actually helping climate by doing that, somebody's going to actually be willing to pay us money to do this. So I think while some pocketed money from carbon credits and some of the market value added premium from this, the real value of this whole thing was that it made us start measuring how we were improving soils. You don't get paid to do something that's improving soil quality unless you can quantify how much good you're doing. And so this is one of the early initiatives that made us start looking below the surface of the ground and say, all right, what are we doing? Are we making this better? How do we quantify that value? And why should somebody pay us $4 or $30 a ton for carbon sequestration? I never dreamed that this thing would take me to the heart of the jungles in Mato Grosso where we'd be debating this with naked Indians. But that's where this place goes. And you know, these people had this figured out a long time ago. They can teach us lessons about sustainability and systems approaches to farming. And they might live in grass huts, but they've got Bill Gates technology and internet and they're doing things technologically and understand the synergies of rotations and eating habits that we could all learn from. We did get a dividend. We were one of the first to put this actual sale of carbon credits on the map. A lot of talk was going on, but actually money changing hands. I think our organization was one of the first in the world to do this. And so it put a target on us. So what did you do? Why did you do it? And so many of us in this room were actually having to participate in the educational process of how direct seeding affected climate change for the good. Another, another major focus of this organization and probably the primary reason why we were formed was there was a desire to have a more coordinated approach to research in the PNW that worked on conservation systems. A lot of our research was directed to wheat, barley, peas, canola. It was commodity specific. We weren't looking at systems approaches and so this was designed to fill that void. And I think this organization at first was viewed as a competitor and we made it clear no we're not here to compete we're here to collaborate we're here to be the the one that fills that void that brings us all together talking more about the systems issues how many of you in this room grow wheat how many grow barley how many grow peas how many grow canola so how many of you see yourself as a wheat farmer a canola farmer a pea farmer we're a resource manager and we've got a whole bunch of opportunities to use our resource to grow some kind of marketable product. And the more we think about that as what our real job is, and the more we look at what is the right combination of commodity crops, uh, maybe introduction of animal systems. I mean, we're, we're farmers, we're loggers, we're hunters. We do all kinds of things on our farm where it's forced us to say we're not a farmer, we're not a rancher, we're not a logger, we're not a hunter. We are truly a resource manager and trying to balance the best way to use those resources is a constant challenge. It's one thing to say this is, this is a practice that's more economically sustainable, but how do you deliver on that promise? This was a huge challenge. We were asked constantly to prove why direct seeding is more efficient. How much fuel will you save? How much money is saved in labor? Um, in the early, well, in 2000, I was serving on the Farm Financial Standards Council and we were getting tremendous pressure all across the grain industry to develop standards for management accounting. And the real theme there was, what is our cost of production? How do we calculate this? How do we create benchmarking models where we can compare what we're doing to our neighbors? And three years into this project, we realized this was a way bigger job than we ever dreamed. At the time, we had a local group that had really made transition from, in the early days, our direct seed breakfast group was focusing, okay, what's the best drill? How do we get a crop out of the ground? 
Then they evolved to what's the best nutrient management systems. And we kind of went through a lot of the agronomy issues and then there to the point with, is this really making it better or worse? How do we quantify if this is a better system economically? So we wrote a grant to see if we could test drive these standards and see if farmers could actually implement management accounting and come up with a uniform approach to doing cost of production. So we had 30 growers that worked together on a project for about two years. If you look at the expected outcomes that we would have on direct seeding, I think you'd summarize these as the following. We hope to reduce operating costs. We want to increase margins. We hope to improve environmental quality. We should be using less capital to produce the same amount of revenue. And ultimately, if we do all these things, we should have a higher return on equity. The question is, can you measure all this stuff? How would you do it? You have to be careful how you draw conclusions. We have wild turkeys that we see right outside our window almost all winter. If you look at these, how many of you have heard a wild turkey gobble? It's, horrendous. it's amazing, huh? <laughs> One year, our four-year-old nephew from Seattle was out, and we were giving shots in the in calving season, and Kyle was just about ready to give a shot, and these turkeys were all across the canyon in the woods, and they let out this big and Kyle's eyes just got big as saucers, and his mother, Christine, said, Kyle, what was that? Kyle said, Indians! <laughs> we have about as much sense in some of our interpretations of data sometimes as that conclusion. But I think this whole project really opened our eyes that we can measure strategic change. This is a circle that's designed to simplify your understanding of operational versus strategic planning. And I don't laugh, I'm going to make this really simple. Every decision that you make, everybody in this room, is either an operating or strategic decision. In the center of that circle, every year you decide what to do, what are you going to grow, how are you going to market it, how are you going to finance it, what capital you need to buy and sell, and it goes into a budget. That's your operating plan. But all the while you're doing that, that outer circle is describing your strategic approach. How are you doing it today? How much technology are you using? Are you aligning with a neighbor or doing it on your own? Are you using conventional farming or are you using a, a more conservation-oriented system? So the how very much affects the what. So when you look at what we as, as a group in here were doing, when we're making a transition from conventional, or I call it, I don't call it conventional, because to my mind, direct seeding is conventional. I would like to refer to the old way as intensive tillage, okay? And we need to take away the term conventional from that era. So when you look at the Clearwater Direct Seed Group, and we were trying to measure the strategies that we were changing, we were changing our tillage system. We were adopting massive technology. Most people were sharing drills or tractors or sprayers with neighbors, so lots of strategic alliances. The average grower in this group, from the time they were doing intensive tillage to direct seed, had doubled the size of their operation. Same people, same investment in capital equipment was farming twice the acres. And that is a proven fact, and I can show you all over the U.S. that's probably not just a Northwest trend. So all those boxes that have a red box around them were strategic shifts in a business. So if you make changes in all those areas, how would you quantify the impact on your bottom line? When you look at from an activity-based costing approach, you look at the activities of putting in a pea crop using the old system. If you're going over this ground eight times a year, and these are very old numbers, you could easily quantify a $45 an acre overhead cost to get that crop in the ground. Peas, even today, are a higher intensity in a direct seed system, but easily $10 to $20 an acre reduction in costs. That's just one way of quantifying on a per acre. One of the things that we did in the, the Farm Financial Standards Council project was got people to reevaluate what is a cost and profit center report. You have to decide what is, what's your primary commodity and what are all the direct and indirect costs to produce that. We want to get it down to a common metric of what is the cost per bushel, the cost per pound to grow what you're growing, and where is the revenue coming from that product. We took data from some growers in this group and showed in a before versus after um, comparison that there was an overall 21% drop 
in total direct and indirect costs. So that sounds great, but how does that affect bottom line? This is a picture of a schematic that uses the DuPont model to evaluate the impact of financial performance. If you look at everybody here, our number one goal financially is to do what? Have a good return on equity. All these 21 ratios that we calculate are interesting, but the number one thing you're going to be looking at is how is my ROE? And you want that good for two reasons. You hope that you will retire and have a nest egg that you'll be comfortable with, and you hope to have some wealth that you can maybe pass on to the next generation. And we only build wealth by having good operating efficiency, by using capital effectively to generate revenue, and using debt leverage effectively. So when you take these three legs, or like the three legs on a milk stool, our group was able to take these three legs and show that in a before and after situation, our turnover ratio, because we were generating twice as much revenue for the same investment in capital, doubled. So we went from 50% to a one-to-one -one relationship on revenue generated versus capital invested. Profit margin, this is, this is a reflection of our cost efficiency, went up almost a third, from 12 to 16 percent. Return on assets was 6.5 versus 17, almost two and a half times. If you remember in early 2000, farming was not that lucrative. We were virtually at a break-even situation. And there was a lot of people, really talented farmers, were saying, why am I in this business? We were in a four to five percent return on equity. There were high interest rates. There was a lot of places we could go with our money where we could make more in this. When you quantify the total impact of all these strategic changes, if you could make a 23% return on equity, what's your attitude about staying in farming? There weren't very many places we could go and make that kind of return. So this is, this is not, everybody is not going to be able to achieve this, but it, it proved two things. One is that there is a huge positive value between making this transition if you do it right, and second of all, it told us we can measure the impact of strategic change. Not everybody in that group did all the data, but the five or six that actually got all the data done, the other 25 people were looking over their shoulders and they learned a lot from the methodology and gave them a lifetime journey of how to ramp up their financial processes. Another facet of the, the movement to direct seed is that we should be able to reap value-added dividends or get cost-sharing systems in that can help incentivize the transition. So we were fortunate early on to have things like equip, equip, conservation district funding. We had a lot of low interest rate loan programs that many times took some of the bite out of making this transition. There were also on the positive side things like the Food Alliance certification and the monetizing of carbon sequestration where we got a benefit over and above the improved efficiency from operations. People were paying us a premium because we were doing it a way that the consumers thought was better for the society and the environment. If you look at the Shepherd's Grain, the Food Alliance relationship, this was a great model where they were one of the early pioneers in, in helping forge a certification program. If you had a 1,200 acre farm with 80 bushel wheat and you could get a 60 cent bushel, you could, a premium, that's $72,000. I'm not saying everybody achieves this, but it just shows you that if somebody's willing to pay you 20, 30, or 40 cents premium because they like the way you farm, why would you not invest in the paperwork and the process of trying to seek out that kind of a premium? This slide really says it all. It's a slide that we created to help describe all the benefits in direct seeding. It improves both economic and environmental sustainability. It sequesters carbon, it increases organic matter, it improves air and water quality. We lower our fossil fuel use. We actually quantified that we are reducing fuel consumption three and a half to four gallons an acre, and it increases economic viability. We have to be able to continue to demonstrate that we're achieving all these things. I think earlier on we thought we were doing a better job on many of these things than we really are. And I think this is a good entree to talk about what are the challenges of the future. If we look at where we need to go as individual farmers and both as an organization, there are many challenges in these five areas. In the information exchange area, 
Um, I'm so excited to see our, our leadership and our board back in action and we're starting to get newsletters out. We now have a conference today that is a reflection of that leadership. I, I just can't say how excited I am to see the, the collaborative relationship between the oil seeds and the, the direct seeders. I think both of these audiences tend to be some of the leading edge and most progressive farmers in the Northwest. And uh, someday this may be the conference to go to. Uh, that's very much the way it is up in Canada at the Farm Tech, where it started out as a no-till organization, then they paired up with pulses and oil seeds. And today at Farm Tech, they're going to have 1,800 people at a conference. I'm going to be up there next week, and it's unbelievable. That is the conference that everybody wants to move their thing to. The challenge is, are we engaging our non-traditional partners? Are we continuing to make sure that the consumers, the environmental groups are out here seeing what we're doing? Are we also engaging our policymakers back east? There's major issues going on right now with the Farm Bill, conservation titles, and CSP. Do they know what you want, what you think is workable for you, and who is representing you in these issues? In the research area, there's been a lot of hype about how we're improving soils. I think earlier on we thought we were doing wonderful things for our soils. As we've gotten better at evaluating soils and pushing the soil test down a little deeper, we're not making as much improvement as we thought. We're seeing, some people are seeing compaction that we thought we'd get rid of as long as we had no-till and we had oil seeds. Um, some are saying, no, that's, that's, we still have a problem. A lot of us thought that organic matter was a no-brainer. We were going to continue to get better at no organic matter. But when people started measuring three feet deep, many cases they couldn't prove the total organic matter change, it just moved closer to the surface. So if we're out selling carbon credits because we're increasing organic matter when it's only increasing the top four inches, but it's actually declining down deep, theoretically we sold something that we didn't actually do. So how are we plugging our research people into better understanding how 20 years of direct seeding has changed pH? compaction, organic matter, and what are some of the tools that we're going to need to do to deal with some of these changes if they're negative. There's a program called the REACH Project. How many of you are familiar with this program? There's a lot. There's $25 million a year going into the PNW, which is a, a, a feeding opportunity to feed research and outcomes. And they create a lot of data, and I would challenge this organization to pay a lot of attention to what they're doing and demand outcomes where you can get better input on farming practices. Farming is notorious for accumulating data, but then we fall short on how to interpret that data and how, how to make better management decisions. And we'll come to precision ag in a little bit. This is a classic area where REACH should be really helping us to better strategize how to do precision farming. I think there's a challenge out there of how to deal with animal ag. Where does this fit or should it fit in a direct seed system? We still have some fenced fields, and it's absolutely amazing the difference in those fields where we can turn cattle out there after a grain crop. The China lettuce is the first thing you eat. They're a very cheap weed seeker. Now, Fritz, you may disagree with that. Fritz has people that come to his place and put sheep on it for free while he just goes and collects his coupons, right? But anyway, we don't know where do we need to be, but we've torn a lot of fences out. Some of these people have decided they'd never be an ag, animal ag again. We need to rethink that as a system. Where are we in vertical tillage? There are people that are that were dedicated no-tillers, direct seeders that are buying rippers now because they're seeing their canola plants go down four inches and go sideways. And they thought that that would solve all their problems. So do we have compaction? Do we need deep rippers? Do we need a, a cover crop? What do we need to address this if it is a problem? Or are we just buying these things because we miss recreational tillage? Um, years ago, we took over a neighboring place. The ground was so rough, you had to have a seat belt to stay in the sprayer seat. So we said, well, we're going to have to rip this ground. We're going to have to cultivate it. It's pretty bad when you have to put sunglasses on and hide when you're in this cultivator because the rumor's out that, did you see Dick Whitman was in a cultivator? So we can get up on a pedestal sometimes and to say you're never going to till again probably is not realistic, but there should be some science behind what we do when we do it. Are we, how are we doing on research varieties that are adapted to drip seed systems? Many of our commodity products were developed for a conventional or an intensive tillage environment. The jury's still out on whether or not we've actually gotten 
more progress on crops that can grow in high residue in a minimum disturbance environment. Precision ag is one of my biggest pet thieves. I mean, everybody agrees we should do it, but how much help we're getting from the research committee on how to apply this has got a long ways to go. Um, it's pretty bad when you get some of the best experts in the world and you, and you look at your maps and your systems for prescriptions and say, how can I do this better? And their response is, you know more about this than we do. I agree we may know our fields better, but we need much more science out there on not only how to vary fertilizer, but how do we vary seed rates. That's our number one concern right now, and we've probably made big strides on varying, doing variable rate on fertilizer, but we don't have any idea what to do on seed. So I'm pleading with everybody out here that has a knowledge on this, make this a priority for the future. Cover crops, in my mind, this is not a if, but how do we do it? Where are the opportunities work could apply? After the workshop that Todd and I went through last winter, it was almost as exciting to see what the opportunities could be for that as a new management scheme as some of the opportunities we saw in direct seeding. It just makes sense that keeping something alive and growing on your soils, the more you do, the more likely you're going to have healthy soils. But we're not South Dakota. We're not in the Midwest where it rains all summer. So trying to adapt some of these concepts to our microclimate is going to be a challenge. In the policy area, we need to take control of what the term sustainability means. A lot of people out there are, are saying they are the system. Organics, naturals, in my opinion, these are not sustainable farming systems. So be in the debate, get involved in the programs that things like Walmart that's trying to define what that is. I serve on a national group that was originally the Ag Carbon Market Working Group. It evolved to the Clark Group, which now evolved to the group called Vila. But these people have a small, about 25 people that are actively engaged in working with some of our major companies like Walmart, where they're going to define what sustainability is. And if you're not at the table, you won't like their definition. There will be a day where if you don't, if your product can't meet their sustainability index, it won't be on their shelf. So th this falls right in with what you're trying to do to get certified, and I think we can do a lot to educate them on what sustainable really is. There's a lot of hype about how the U.S. is number one. Folks, we're far from number one in this topic. When you look at what the Southern American, Chile, and Australia, New Zealand, some of these other countries are doing with the adoption of conservation ag, we have been so fortunate to learn from our neighbors here. That doesn't mean that we don't do, do a lot of good things, but a lot of it comes back to what are the basic principles of conservation ag. And these six principles were adopted many years ago at a World Conservation of, of Ag conference. And I'm, I'm really hoping that some, more, some of your folks here can get up to the conference in Canada this year. It's rare that we get this conference this close to our part of the world. But your administrators, your board members, I would really encourage you to get up to this conference. The, ch the climate change policy is not over. The best thing to kill climate change debate was what? The recession. We pretty much killed that, but it didn't make the problem go away. And the science in terms of emissions and concentrations in the atmosphere, it's not gone away. So it will be back, and we have to ask ourselves, are we just going to pass this bar bill to our grandkids, or are we going to deal with it? I strongly recommend this organization be in that discussion. And it's not about what's causing it or not. It's like, how do you want to position your industry to prove the things that you're doing that help reduce emissions, that help improve the environment, and if there's a financial reward for it, let's be the ones receiving a dividend, not paying a penalty or a tax. So it, it involves getting engaged in both your commodity groups and your conservation groups. On policy issues, we are having a hard time getting a farm bill right now, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be back there in their face. We need to do this both as a Northwest group, but I think more powerfully if we can work on the networking that we have with these other no-till groups, they will hear our message as a broader coalition and they'll listen to us. So Karen Scanlon has been doing a great job of keeping this CASA networking organization alive. If not only this group, but some of these other groups in this network, they're planning on sending quite a contingent up to this Congress in uh, Canada. 
they want to hear your voice. So you have to be there. From an economic viability, we're getting close to the end here. We had a lot of luck early on proving this was economically viable, but we're in a whole new world right now. I teach at the TPAP program every year, and I've never seen a year like this where looking at people's, they, it was like, it's look, farmers are like looking at the deer in headlights. They're looking at grain values dropping to half of what they were two years ago, and they have a cost structure that's gone beyond their ability to even measure. So they're scared, and they're starting to wonder, how am I going to survive in the next three or four years? In my opinion, you guys have a leg up because we already know this system is more economically viable. But that doesn't mean this doesn't impact us, and we're going to probably have to dust off our principles on how to get to cost of production, how do we look at getting even better in terms of our financial performance. This slide shows the trends in fuel, fertilizer, equipment costs, cost of gain in the livestock industry. Years ago, I used to track the Drover's Magazine number that showed the cost of gain on cattle. 50 cents was not an unreasonable cost of gain. Then it went to a dollar. This last August, it was a dollar 21. So two and a half times what it cost several years ago to put a pound of gain on. Now, if you're a cattle guy right now, you love corn prices going down, right? So here's an opportunity, direct seeders. You can put some fences up, and whatever money you lose in farming, you can make back running cattle if you could find one to buy. The certification program, I'm very excited about where the state of Washington is going with this. I hope we can make this a not only a Pacific Northwest, but you can be a leader in helping national NRCS and FSA people see this as a model. And uh, we can help design a certification system that might be the foundation for CSP or EQIP eligibility or a lot of these other programs. Cover crops, you're going to hear a lot more on this, so I won't spend any time here. But I want to know not only how it will help my soil, what's the projected economic benefit? The research people need to be hooking up with the ag economists, and we need to be able to show that this model is better financially as well as better agronomically. Technology, one of my worst pet peeves is the equipment sale, the support system, is just lasts as long as it takes to deliver the combine or the drill to the farm. And folks, if we're spending $400,000 on a piece of equipment and it's got $10,000 worth of technology on it, I want $395,000 worth of support out there to make sure this $10,000 piece of computer works. And we've got to get more ability ramped up. We've been really blessed to have the quality people that help us right now, but these guys are running ragged. And we can't destroy their personal lives by expecting a few people to be out here working seven days a week when it's time to seed. So you make your voices be known. These equipment companies have made good money selling iron the last few years. We need to demand that they ramp up their technology support because you've got to be able to know how this yield monitor works. You have to know how that variable rate application system is actually going to work. And there's nothing more frustrating than having $750,000 worth of iron sitting in the field and you can't go because you can't figure out what cable doesn't work. From a standpoint of management software, many of you have had Agronomy software like FarmWorks where you track farm records and you've used this for your precision ag. You've got good quality accounting systems like Red Wing or CenterPoint. But very few of these systems have done a good job of integrating across from the agronomy all the way to the end. We've got to get there. I'm involved with a company in California which is a Silicon Valley bunch of geniuses that have made more money than they can spend. They've decided they're going to build one of these. And I'm going, good luck. And I'm helping to advise them on how big the problem is because I'm not convinced that anybody can do this. But they have the money, they have the passion to do it, so we'll see where that goes. But it would be ideal someday if we could have a completely integrated system that goes from the agronomy planning through the execution of work orders all the way through into our financial accounting. And we can see how that decision of what to plant and what inputs to put in results in a change in the cost of production. We've got to get there. Again, I, I mentioned earlier how great it is to see the, the leadership we have today, the active board. We need new blood. I heard yesterday they opened it up to where anybody that served on this board before could reapply. Folks, that's crazy. There are so many talents out here, and you young folks, that it, it, this is one of the greatest opportunities I've ever had is to serve on this board. 
And I'd, I'd much rather see us get some new blood in here than recycle some of us old guys. No, nothing against those that have continued to serve. So look at this as an organization where you can take back way more than you invest. I'm going to leave you with the parting thought. Have we completed our mission? When we first started this organization, we paralleled a lot we were doing with what Alberta was doing with the their Alberta Conservation Tillage Society and their Reduced Tillage Initiative, which were two government programs collaborating to provide money and education. Several years ago, Axe went away and Artie went away. And some looked at that as a failure. And it was not a failure. It was a reflection of their success. They achieved their mission. But today, they have a farm tech conference which is still talking about conservation. It's bringing in all the other commodity groups and it's all about systems. You have resource managers, 1,800 resource managers coming to a conference next week to learn about how to be better resource managers. And there's pulses, and there's oil seeds, and there's wheat growers, and there's barley growers, and there's conservation people all up there. So folks, you heard the story about Wayne Gretzky, why he was so successful. He always said, I'm not going where the puck is, I'm going where the puck's going. So I hope this organization can challenge itself and say, where's the pot going? How do we go there and we continue to be a leader? Summarizing, looking back, we have a lot to be proud of. We owe a big thanks to our board, Kay, and all the work that they've done. But we can't rest on our laurels. These are the products that we're selling right now. Information exchange, research, policy development, funding and membership development. Uh, I want to thank you all for helping us get to this journey. Our farm, our partners could never be where we are today without you, and I challenge you to take these challenges seriously. So thank you.